Okay, in this video I decided to uh, go back to initial mobilization because of the way things are looking. I decided to go back, look at what I've already done and see if there's anything I should add to it. And something that occurred to me is you're mobilizing, not everyone shows up or you uh, link up with other organizations or other people come with you that you trust. They may not have been part of your unit as you trained beforehand. I got a feeling that uh, as things get closer here, that something could kick off. We're going to see smaller militias that they uh, knew of each other beforehand, had some communication with each other beforehand. They may not have trained with each other, but there was good relations with them. They may decide to come together to form larger units. Yes, you're going to have more security in that stuff with the people you knew as being part of, say, a fire team. But a fire team's not going to be able to accomplish a hell of a lot. Now, a fire team, for those that aren't aware of it, because apparently there are people watching these videos who never served, don't know a damn thing on military history. A fire team typically has between three to five people in it. Two to three fire teams make up a squad. So a squad has anywhere typically from six to ten troops depending on your organization and the area era that you're trying to emulate. World War I squads were and platoons were much larger than they are now. And a platoon is two to four squads that of roughly a total of 20 to 40 people inside a platoon. Now, first thing you're going to do, we've, we're at our uh, final rally point. We're issuing out equipment. People's getting their stuff. We're trying to figure out, we got to know who showed up and where were they previously assigned. It could be a situation where you had a squad where only two people showed up. The other, say, six to eight didn't make it. They either decided not to come in or they got taken out. Who knows? They could have been arrested. Well, those two people that are left, they can't operate on their own, so you're going to have to move them somewhere else. So go through, you look at your organization. Who showed up? Where were they assigned? Get a good count. You know, how many people showed up for each squad and each fire team? Then you want to, especially on the ones that are very under strength, say below 75% strength from before the mobilization happened, only 70, you know, less than 75% of the people showed up for that squad or team. Identify skills. You want to find out what background people have. You know, do you have people that were military engineers? Did they work construction? Were they heavy equipment operators? Do you have people that used to be in the military? Were they mortarmen or field artillery? Well, they can be part of your indirect fire infantry. You know, they'll be the ones that'll get a hold of the mortars as you capture them. Or if you had people that worked in field artillery and they worked in a fire direction center for artillery well maybe use them put them in charge of your mortar teams put them in the fire direction center identify anyone who uh, served in air defense maybe you're going to want to pull them have them uh, set aside to make up their own uh, teams and squad identify the people with medical skills especially higher level medical skills if they're not already designated as medics, you're probably going to want to do that. Identify other skills such as who's a mechanic, you know, works on vehicles. Identify people with gunsmithing skills, reloading skills. Identify if people have a IT background or are uh, licensed radio operators, ham radio operators. 
Try to get all these uh, different special skills. Find out who has what as you're reorganizing the unit here. And if people don't have a special skill or anything like that, or you got too many of one particular skill, well, the catch-all is always your infantry, your riflemen. Now, as you're uh, reorganizing the unit, you're going to try to cross-level and try to keep teams together if possible, at least buddy teams. You don't want to take someone and shove them somewhere by themselves if they've never worked with that new group ever in the past. So let's say we have three militias are coming together. One shows up with only three people. One shows up with 20. One shows up, you know, with 10. You're trying to even the stuff out. You're trying to form squads and that. Well, the three people, you're probably going to want to keep them together keep them together on a squad. They're their own start of a fire team. Maybe you'll add one or two people to it. Maybe you have a uh, person in that 20 person militia who was a specialist in the National Guard. May not have been infantry, but had a little bit of rank, had some people under them because of being a team leader. We'll take that specialist, put them in charge of those three people if they didn't have someone with uh, corresponding skills to be able to lead people in combat, so to speak. So, your priority should be your line squads. So, your infantry squads, your engineer squads, your mortar teams. I would put air defense in there. So it's more important that they be at full strength than your headquarters. It doesn't do you any good to have a fully staffed headquarters and really no one on the ground actually doing the missions. So you could have plenty of people, you know, in your operations section, plenty of radio operators, cooks, mechanics, and all that, but you got only five people that are actually on the ground pulling triggers you know it doesn't matter if you have a headquarters section of 40 people and you can plan anything for up to a division you're not really going to accomplish much so i can see this is going to be something that's going to happen you know we're going to have a lot of smaller militia units out there that just weren't able to recruit you know, they have social contacts with people in other militias. We're getting close to something's going to kick off. And these smaller groups are going to realize, hey, we're not going to be able to accomplish as much. There's only five of us. We can ambush convoys, but we're not going to be able to cause so much damage that we're going to be able to take stuff off of the uh, kills inside the kill zone. It might turn out to be just hit and run ambushes. We can do sniper attacks, we can do IED attacks, but we can't wipe out an enemy patrol and strip them of all their equipment and supplies. So then those smaller groups really should join other groups. You know, two smaller groups join in together, well, maybe you can at least get a squad. A squad can do a hell of a lot more than a couple buddy teams or a fire team. Or you have a squad size militia, you know, they get that uh, team size militia that's four people or less, you know, they come over. Well, now you have a, you still have a squad size militia, but now you have three fire teams instead of just the two. So now a big question and a big problem is who should be in overall command? My recommendations on this, it should be the most knowledgeable, capable, and best skilled leader, preferably someone with a military background. This should not be a high school popularity contest. You're not picking someone to be the head of the football team. You want someone that knows what they're doing. I don't care how popular they are on the outside, how many people they know. It's going to be how knowledge they, knowledgeable they are because you're you're look you're trying to pick someone who's going to be doing the overall operational planning for your operations so they got to know what they're doing but at the same time they have to have some leadership skills you know you can be the best person ta uh, tactically for planning operations but have absolutely no leadership skills 
that does happen so maybe you're going to have these uh, groups together say that's three militias come together well of the three leaders of those militias who's the most knowledgeable do you have one that was a non-commissioned officer or one that was an officer you know and the other person was maybe just a specialist well if it turns out that that non-commissioned officer all he was was a mechanic well maybe we don't want him necessarily planning combat operations well what about that officer well if that officer was just a supply officer he was just in charge of a platoon and a quartermaster company he doesn't necessarily know a hell of a lot about tactical operations either he probably knows the logistics and then that specialist that lower level enlisted maybe he was infantry he has a tour overseas he knows what he's doing well as long as he has the leadership skills he might end up being the person that has to be in charge of that unit now the the next most capable person really should become his assistant or his executive officer so then maybe at that point that officer who was in a quartermaster unit he becomes the executive officer of this newly forming militia unit so you have the specialist who's now the overall commanding officer the former look uh, quartermaster officer from the military he's now the executive officer he's got the uh skills for filling that position well that uh, mechanic you know was a non-commissioned officer maybe you're going to have him as your platoon sergeant then or at a minimum he's one of the squad leaders or if your unit's large enough maybe he becomes the first sergeant i don't know so this is you know i i know this doesn't give you the specifics on how to do this this just gets you thinking that's the main purpose of this this particular video is to getting you thinking our uh, unit has mobilized we've gone to the field we're noticing not everyone showed up maybe we got uh, people coming in you know let's say uh, Joe over here well he knew uh, these guys in this other militia over here but they only had like three people well Joe brings those three guys with him he knows them has been friends with them for years you know fit him in the unit if he'll vouch for him if you trust uh, Joe you trust his uh, instincts well you got three more recruits or let's say uh, John on uh, the other side his brother was in the National Guard and uh, some of his buddies uh, linked up with uh, Joe's brother or John's brother and John brings them in with him you know some of them have their own gear you know they're already experienced they've already served integrate them into the unit somehow that's where it comes in to identify those skills what was their experience what was their background where can you best fit them in so all this should be done fairly quickly it might take about 24 maybe 48 hours because you got to find out the specifics on people see how they are check out their background a little bit you know can they verify it if someone says that they're skilled in something well prove it if you if you have someone that says oh yeah i'm a experienced gunsmith all right well uh, prove it we got a couple uh, weapons over here that have problems fix them or someone says that oh yeah i was an it specialist in this company well were you the actual specialist or were you just the person that uh, took the phone calls and wrote down what what the problem was were you the actual person that fixed things or were you just the one that answered the phones so try to find out what you can find out where is the best place to put someone now you're probably wondering on the air defense teams well if we don't have any aircraft missiles and that type of stuff we don't have stingers in that why have these uh, this air defense team set off to the side you can use 50 cals as air defense granted it'll be a set up uh, position that air defense team will probably be set up at your uh, 
base camp all the time or most of the time or maybe you'll move them out set them up over a uh, landing zone because you heard there's going to be a landing coming in you can use 50 cals you can use m60s or uh, m240s for defending a uh, landing zone also your air defense team should also be uh, skilled somewhat for taking out drones. Not, not every drone is going to be flying around at 10,000 feet. You're going to have the little backpack ones that will be zipping around at 100 feet or less. So identify those people. You know, if you got people that were air defense artillerymen, hey, take a note of it and stuff and use them to maybe set up your little air defense for your unit <coughs> now for all my engineer brothers in the patriot and militia movements always remember essay ons <laughs>